And the title is, The Outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It tells us in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God. This is God talk, not man talk. I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And as I said in the opening, when you study the Word of God, and in studying the Word of God, you're studying God Himself, His ways, His character. And God is not fickle. He doesn't waver. God is true to His Word and true to His ways. He does not change. So by the Word, we have an opportunity to really know and understand God. That way we can cooperate with Him when we know Him and understand Him. We can work with Him. We can please Him. So when you study God in His ways, you understand or will understand that God is patient and He's very merciful for the sake of humanity. Giving them warning and every opportunity to be spared before He sends His judgment. Peter wrote of this in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, His promise of His return. He's not slack. As some men count slackness, and men do. Because Peter went on to write how in the last days there would be mockers, scoffers, unbelievers, saying, where is the sign of His coming? Where is that promise? It's not being fulfilled. Everything continues on as it always has from the beginning of creation. And that we know that's not true. Just in the last decade or two, society has rapidly devolved, while knowledge has rapidly increased, and it's changed our civilization. Things are not the same. But Peter continues, For the Lord, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word. He's long-suffering to humanity, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Jesus warned that before He would return to earth, that civilization on earth would be like the days of Noah. A civilization, as the Bible describes, where every imagination of the thoughts of the heart was only evil, Continually. And Peter, again, he wrote about God's long suffering in Noah's day towards that civilization. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, which sometime were disobedient. When once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. I'm drawn, through this message, I'm going to draw parallels to this final hour that we live in, different parallels, one of which is Noah's society and Noah's day. In that evil, wicked society, the Bible says eight souls found grace in the eyes of God. Eight souls received an abundance of God's grace as they labored in grace to build the ark of safety, decade after decade after decade. God patiently waiting, hoping not only to save Noah and his family, but hoping to save other souls in that evil, wicked civilization. Because Peter also wrote that as they built, Noah was also a preacher of righteousness, declaring the Word of God. Upon completion of the ark, the, door, the Bible says the door of the ark remained open for seven days, so that whosoever wanted to board and be saved would have the opportunity. So this tells us that the ark was not built solely for eight souls and animals. This mammoth project, this ark was built 
for many souls along with the animals. But as we know in the Word of God, not many souls boarded the ark in that seven days. In fact, no souls boarded the ark outside of Noah and his family in that seven-day grace period. And once that grace period was over, God shut the door of the ark and judgment fell. Today we are witnessing, as I said, the rapid decline of society. People are becoming more and more like the description of Noah's society. Yet we know by the word of God that he is patient and he is merciful. He is not eager with blood lust to pour his wrath upon this world as prophesied in the book of Revelation and other prophecies in the word. God is love. That's how the Bible describes God. He is love. And just as he patiently waited for Noah's family to complete the ark, he is patiently waiting now as the bride of Christ makes herself ready to present, to be presented unto the groom. God patiently waiting for every soul to be saved that can be saved. Patiently waiting for every bridal company member's garments to be made just right in preparation for that marriage celebration of the Lamb. And as it was with Noah and his family, the bride of Christ, too, has found grace in the eyes of God. And for her, God's grace is abounding, because sin is abounding. And it tells us in Romans, Paul wrote in Romans chapter 5, verse 20, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And keep that before you as you journey the last distance between here and rapture ground. Now what does abound mean? Exist in large numbers or amounts. Other words you could use for abound? Plentiful, abundant, flourish, bountiful. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So the more that sin flourishes in our society, even more of God's grace will flow and be manifested unto God's children. This is what I speak of, the great outpouring of the Spirit. And this outpouring will also be unto every soul that desires God's grace to save them. Because as Peter spoke that prophecy of Joel about the great outpouring of the Spirit, later in what he spoke, he also said this, that whosoever would call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's abundant grace. That's the outpouring of the Spirit. The grace of God that is flowing to God's children today, as I said, is the great outpouring of the Spirit, prophesied in Acts 2.17. Just as Noah received abundance of grace, so too is the bride receiving an abundance of grace through the outpouring of the Spirit. God's grace is being poured out in, by the Holy Spirit upon all flesh. In other words, it's being made available to all flesh. This is God's mercy before judgment. But understand this, and remember this, as in Noah's day, not all flesh will receive this great abundance of God's grace. Remember, when the ark was completed, only eight souls boarded. In our day, as human hearts and minds become increasingly consumed with evil imaginations, not all flesh desires God's outpouring of the Spirit. Because as Jesus said, the condemnation upon man is they love darkness more than light. Like Noah and his family, the bridal company members 
they will be the greatest beneficiaries of this outpouring. However, in order, to in order to receive the fullness of this outpouring, the bride must separate from the evil contamination of this society. Sanctified, separated by the Word of God and the presence of God. Focused, as Noah and the family was, on the divine mission. As I stated in times past, and will continue to do so, beware of the numerous distractions in our society that have multiplied innumerously through technology. The pleasures, the entertainments, all of this technology, many of which are not sinful. But the, what, what it does is it consumes your time and your focus. And by doing so, it will greatly hinder your relationship with the Lord, keeping you out of God's presence, which hinders your spiritual growth, which will then make you spiritually weak and vulnerable. The end result is this. The great outpouring of the Spirit being made available to all flesh in these last days will have little effect on your life, even though you're saved, even though you may have the Holy Ghost. This outpouring will have little effect upon you. It's like holding up an umbrella as the rain of the Spirit is falling. These umbrellas in a person's life, they come in many different forms. For example, doubt, disobedience can be an umbrella. Selfishness. Feelings, umbrellas, the rain of the Spirit being deflected off of your life. Spiritual laziness, or as Jesus put it, lukewarmness. Lack of time, lack of effort in developing and cultivating that relationship with the Lord. Child of God with umbrellas in hand, you may get a little wet. Like in a big, heavy rain outside with your umbrella, you, you'll get a little wet, but the majority of it is deflected off of you. Don't be deceived. With any kind of spiritual umbrella in your life, you are not receiving the fullness of the outpouring of the Spirit. You may get a little wet and you may deceive yourself. Oh. I've got the Holy Ghost. I speak in tongues. I'm a little wet here. I'm, I'm receiving from the Lord. But not in abundance. You're not. Not in fullness. No. This is the great outpouring of the Spirit that we are in the midst of, saith God. How much of it are you receiving? What price are you paying to receive it? Do you even believe the Word of God? That you're in the midst of an outpouring? The Apostle Paul gave important instruction to the Spirit-filled church. First, taking you to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 19. He instructs simply, quench not the Spirit. Then in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, 
whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So, child of God, who's Spirit-filled, you have a responsibility. You better not grieve the Holy Spirit in your life. Because He's the one who seals you unto the day of redemption. He's the one who takes the blood, uses it to produce a born-again experience in your life. Don't grieve Him. Don't quench Him. You must learn to yield to Him daily, work with Him, and let Him do His work on you that you may receive the great outpouring He offers. So don't be deceived by all the distractions of this life. What you are involved in, you can justify yourself saying it's not sinful, but that's not the point. Because what you're involved in is, is a distraction and is keeping you from the Lord and hindering your spiritual growth. No, again, I say you may not be sinning, but you're not spiritually growing either. Your soul may be clean, but the distractions of this life will make your mind carnal. And don't forget that. The Holy Spirit's laying it out very simply so everyone can understand. Carnal goes beyond lust, sin, filth like that. Carnal can simply mean worldly, focused on this life. And not on the next, the spiritual. A carnal mind is a huge spiritual umbrella in a person's life that will quench the Holy Spirit. Paul wrote this concerning this big spiritual umbrella that many Christians carry. Romans chapter 8, verses 4 and 5, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. In who? Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So check your mind. What do you mind? What is at the center of your mind's attention? What do you pursue and go after? What do you prioritize in life? This is what Paul's saying. Is it the things of the flesh? The things of this life? Or is it the things of the Spirit of God? Where is your mind centered? To live a righteous life in this wicked society that's becoming increasingly more wicked, you need God's grace to abound. But for that grace to abound, for that outpouring of the Spirit to be yours, to sustain you, to keep you, you must walk after the Spirit and mind the things of the Spirit. How much does your mind gravitate daily towards the things of the flesh, the things of this life, versus gravitating towards the things of the Spirit and that which is the Holy Spirit is pouring out in abundance? Paul continues in Romans chapter 8, verses 6 and 7, For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It's division. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So, child of God, if your mind is carnal, you have a major disconnect between you and God, whether you realize it or not. You have a disconnect. You have an umbrella. And you're not receiving from the Lord as you should. 
If your mind is a continual battlefield of fear, torment, despair, doubt, if you're always minding the things of this life, if you're always focused on other people and what they're saying and what they're doing, and not focused on you, yourself, in your own personal relationship with the Lord, minding the things of the Spirit, disconnect. Umbrella. You're not receiving. So it's time to take on a new mind. It's offered. A mind that will pursue the things of the Spirit. A spiritual mind, which results in life and peace. Because the carnal mind, if you don't attend to it, if you don't deal with it, face it and get rid of it, it will ultimately lead to your spiritual death, your spiritual demise. Such a mind is in opposition to God. Opposition to the will of God and the things of God. Such a mind wants its own way, the self way, the flesh way, to please self, to cater to self, to look out for and protect self and the things that self cares about. Whereas the mind of the spirit caters to, lends itself to, focuses on the things of God, the will of God. And what matters to God. This is the bride Jesus is coming for. Special and set apart. Remember, Paul is writing to the church at Rome, not to unbelievers. You may have salvation. Life and peace in your soul. But if your mind does not match your soul... Eventually, you'll fail God. Lukewarm, fail God, disobey God, drift away from God, and backslide. And you may backslide and not even realize it. A carnal mind is preoccupied and focused on this life and the present world. That's not a good place to be in, especially when Jesus said, I'm coming for a bride. Be ready. Stay ready. Because I'm coming in an hour that you don't think. But if your mind is all focused and all about this life and this world, you're not going to be spiritually ready. You may convince yourself you will be, but you're not. Such a mind is not subject to God and His Spirit. With such a mind allowed to continue to operate in a child of God, this big spiritual umbrella will continue to deflect what the Holy Spirit is pouring out. So how can your life be pleasing to God? How can you remain saved? Now let's take a moment at this point to review the process of spiritual growth, what the Lord expects when a person comes into the kingdom. So when a person is born again, made new, free from sin, the next step in growing in the Lord is receiving the baptism in the Holy Ghost. It tells us in Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39, Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Step 1, Salvation. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you. This promise, it's a promise of God. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Then in Acts chapter 2 verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Once you have received the gift of the Holy Ghost, and now this person is abiding in your body, your temple of clay, the next step becomes 
learning Him. In other words, learning how to yield yourself to Him. That you may receive or be able to receive all that He's offering you. If you don't learn how to cooperate with someone, you can't receive from them. Jesus, in teaching the disciples about the Holy Ghost, in John chapter 16, verse 13, he says, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. In John's Gospels, chapters 14 through 16, Jesus really teaches the purpose of the Holy Ghost to the disciples. And in these chapters, Jesus declares the Holy Ghost would be a helper, a guide, a teacher, a comforter. And so while so many Christians, children of God, are focused on receiving the Holy Ghost and Him speaking through them, that's not the focus. The focus shouldn't always be Him speaking through you. The focus for you then becomes allowing Him to speak to you. Because if He can't speak to you on a personal level through the Word, how is He going to help you? How is He going to guide you? How is He going to teach you? How is He going to comfort you? To be all of this to you, he needs your time and your focus. It doesn't just happen because He's in you. The Holy Spirit needs you to take on a spiritual mind. To get rid of the earthly carnal mind. Because a spiritual mind is all that the Holy Spirit can work with. Because any kind of other... Any other kind of mind is enmity against God. You need a mind of life and peace. Child of God, you need a mind that matches your soul. Such a mind is now in a position to receive the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit in its fullness. Psalm 91, verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadows, shadow of the Almighty. The secret place of the Most High is a place reserved for the child of God. It is a place in the presence of God. It is a place that you will learn from the Holy Spirit of God. It is a place where you will spiritually grow and mature and become more Christ-like in nature, the secret place of the Most High. This is the place you need to be to receive the great outpouring of the Spirit. Now, it says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. Now, to dwell means to remain for a time or to live as a resident. He that dwelleth. So it's not an in and out thing. It's unfortunate that many Christians never find this place in their relationship with God. Some, for whatever reason, don't even know it exists for them. While others, they're aware of it, read it in the Bible, preach maybe from the platform that it's there for them to receive, but they don't diligently seek it because they don't care enough about it. Jesus said, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled. It also says God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him diligently, earnestly, sincerely seek Him.
to dwell in the secret place of the Most High. It requires more than a born-again experience in the Holy Ghost baptism. To dwell, to abide, to remain in the secret place of the Most High requires self-sacrifice. Giving of your time, your mind, and devotion in prayers and fastings, in abiding in the Word of God. Child of God, this is how you take down those spiritual umbrellas in your life. This is how you open yourself up and receive all that God is pouring out in it by His Spirit in these last days. Will you or will you not make the sacrifice? If you don't believe it, you won't. If you don't desire it, you won't. But remember what Jesus said. We are to be as devoted to the Word of God as we are devoted to feeding our bodies every day. He also said when we go into the prayer closet or when we fast unto God in secret, He would reward us openly. God's grace would abound. When Noah and his family worked to fulfill the divine mission of building the ark of safety, this required patience and focus. Patiently waiting upon God. Their minds focused on the Lord. Their lives focused on the divine mission. Noah and his family refused to be distracted by the chaos of the wickedness and the evil civilization surrounding them. It was only eight souls. They were surrounded by it. But they weren't going to be distracted by it either. Their minds were focused on God. Spiritual minds of life and peace. And to remain faithful under the completion of the ark, as sin was abounding all around them, the Noah family had to dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Because as they did, they dwelt under the shadow of the Almighty. In other words, they dwelt in God's presence. And in God's presence, they had nothing to fear, nothing to worry about from devil or man that was taking over that world. Nothing to fear. Where sin was abounding, the Noah family found a place of grace, and it abounded for them. In this final hour of great darkness, that place of abundant grace for the bride of Christ, for every member who will diligently seek for it, it will be found in that secret place of the Most High. Dwelling in this place with the Lord, your life goes beyond freedom from sin, your life becomes pleasing God, just as Jesus pleased God. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Spiritual garments uncontaminated and in perfection before the Lord. Ephesians 5, 27, speaking of Jesus, that He might present it to Himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints." A life free from sin and a life that is righteous or well-pleasing to God. Words that are similar to righteous, just, honest, good, upright, ethical, all right. In other words, everything is right. That's righteousness. That's the garments of the bride. 
At this time, I want to take you to a story in the Old Testament, which will bring light to the relationship between the bridal company, the groom Jesus, as well as the purpose of the Holy Spirit and why he, and why he is here on earth. So again, we're drawing a parallel between the story in the Old Testament and the bride, the groom, and the Holy Ghost today. When we can draw parallels like this, it can help us better understand. And by, with better understanding, Lord willing, we better yield ourselves. The book of Esther is about a young Jewish maiden who lived in the kingdom of Persia. Her uncle Mordecai raised her from a little girl. When Esther was a young lady, a decree went forth from the palace throughout the whole kingdom. The king was in search of a wife to be his queen. So all the young maidens throughout the kingdom, which covered many different countries of the world, all of these young maidens, these virgins, all over, they were brought in to the palace to be presented unto the king. And the maiden that pleased the king the most would be chosen queen. Now to organize such a massive project, virgins from all over the kingdom to come in to be presented unto the king, a certain servant who was trustworthy and close to the king, this servant was ordained to organize the process of presenting all of these maidens to the king. As the maidens began to gather from all over the kingdom, the Bible says one young lady stood out to the king's servant above all the other maidens. It was Esther. And Esther pleased the servant. So to her was granted great favor above all the other maidens. When the time arrived for the maidens to begin the process, to go forth to present themselves before the king, it says that each maiden was granted whatever she desired in order to prepare herself to go in before the king. Now, these young maidens, obviously, they, have, they had never met the king, and they did not know what it would take to please the king. Yet, foolishly, they all prepared themselves unto their own liking and their own satisfaction, believing that what pleased them was going to be pleasing to the king. Obviously, this was faulty logic and a lack of wisdom. Now, Esther, in great wisdom and humility, was the only maiden who yielded herself to the king's servant. That the king's servant would prepare her for the king. She understood that the servant knew the king very well. And he would prepare her in a way that would be pleasing unto the king. And at the end of this great process, it was Esther who was chosen by the king to be his wife and queen. Now, how does this apply to us today? The parallel is this. King Jesus is coming back. And he's coming to take a bride to heaven. And this is indicated in Jesus' parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25. And of course, five of the virgins were wise, five of them were foolish. So when Jesus returns, he's going to be selective in who makes up his bridal company. In other words, not all the virgins are going to be selected. He will choose the wise over the foolish. Now here's where the person of the Holy Ghost comes into the picture. Like the servant who organized everything for the king in Persia, the Holy Ghost has been sent into this world. He knows Jesus very well. His divine mission is to prepare 
a bride for Jesus. And as it was in Esther's day, so too in our day, there are foolish virgins who don't recognize the need of the Holy Ghost. Instead, they go about their days seeking to prepare themselves for King Jesus, doing so in a way that is pleasing and satisfactory in their own eyes. Believing it's going to please Jesus. But this is foolish. Because what may be satisfactory to them will not be satisfactory to Jesus. Remember what the Bible says, God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are higher than ours. However, the wise virgins, they recognize the need of the Holy Ghost to prepare them for Jesus' return. Just as Esther recognized the need for the king's servant to prepare her to be presented unto the king. And the wise virgins also understand that it's not enough to have the Holy Ghost. She, they, must yield daily to be prepared, to be pleasing. King Jesus said the Holy Ghost would be a helper and a guide, a teacher and a comforter. The Holy Ghost will promote spiritual growth and maturity when he's inside a child of God and that child of God yields to him. He will prepare bridal company members for Jesus' return. Because the Holy Ghost knows exactly how to prepare the wise virgins in a way that's pleasing to Jesus. He knows the thoughts and ways of God. He knows King Jesus. And it's in the secret place of the Most High. In this place is where the Holy Ghost will meet you every day to do a perfect work in preparation of you to meet King Jesus. It's not enough that the Holy Ghost abides within you. You must make the sacrifice, spend the time with Him in great love and humility, that He may prepare you, that He may take out all of the wrinkles and the blemishes in your spiritual garments, that you may be a part of that glorious church, not just any church, glorious making your life well-pleasing in the sight of the groom. But as we draw closer to Jesus' return, the road's going to be rough. Tests, trials, and tribulations, along with much work to be done. But remember who we are. We're servants of the Lord. The work we do and the sacrifices we make are not so that we are lifted up among people. Neither do we do our work to expect anything in return of people. All that we do, we do as unto the Lord. We do it to please Him. Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord. Child of God, do you realize this responsibility? Ye serve the Lord. Not people, not family, the Lord. And when you face troubles in life, this is where you allow the Holy Ghost in the secret place of the Most High to take you deeper in the Lord that you may grow stronger in faith, that you may become more Christ-like in nature. That's where the growth and the development of your nature happens in the valley, if you let it. Many Christians who don't have the Holy Ghost or 
He's in their life, but they don't yield to him. They draw back on the Lord in difficult, trying times. In situations where they don't understand. They draw back. In their selfish and foolish hearts, they focus on this life, and they can't see beyond. Pleasing self while believing they are pleasing Jesus. And that's deceit. Many people desire to please God and be used of Him, yet they're unwilling to make the sacrifice, to spend the time in the secret place of the Most High. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Friend, listening to this message today, where are you spiritually? You know, the Bible instructs us to examine ourselves if we be in the faith. Don't examine your brothers and sisters as a fault finder. Examine yourself if you be in the faith. Are you a child of God or are you a sinner? Are you a wise virgin or are you a foolish virgin? Do you have the oil of the Spirit or not? Are you yielding to the Spirit each day or not? Have you found that secret place of the Most High? Do you dwell there or not? What kind of mind do you possess? Is it carnal or is it spiritual? Are you an Esther? In love and humility, yielding yourself daily to the Holy Spirit, receiving the outpouring of the Spirit, being prepared to one day be presented to the King, to be chosen, to be one of His bridal company members. If you lack in any way, spiritually speaking, face it now before it's too late. Know who you are in Christ. And if you're coming up short, the Holy Ghost will convict you. He'll show you if you have an honest heart and you want to know. He'll reveal it to you not to tear you down. He'll reveal it to you to build you up. That's the great thing. Because as I said in the opening, our God is patient and He's merciful. He doesn't want anyone to go to hell. But there'll come a day and a time where the Spirit can do no more with humanity. And the hour of grace will be over. And then God's judgment will be poured out like the earth has never seen. Come to Jesus today. Give your heart to the Lord. Pray this prayer with me, and as you pray it, mean it the words you pray from your heart. Say, O oh God, save my soul. I am so sorry for sinning against you, for failing you, but no more. I will serve you the rest of my life until Jesus returns. And I believe the power and the blood of Jesus washes away all of my sin. Say, come into my heart, Jesus. Come into my heart, dear Jesus. And amen. And if you meant that prayer, Jesus is yours. If you meant that prayer. And friend, what Jesus has done for your soul, the power of his blood can do for your body to heal you, to make you new. And many of you, you put in your prayer requests in the comment section. And by faith, put your hand against mine on the screen. All the believers here, Reverend Steve, myself, all gather together to agree for God to move for your prayer request. And if you can't reach the screen, just lift up your hand. Maybe you're at church watching. Lift up your hand unto the Lord. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come. We honor you. 
We honor the blood of your son Jesus, the sacrifice he made for healing, for salvation, for deliverance. O God, lay a healing hand upon each one. By the power and the blood stripes of Jesus, deliver them. Heal in the name of Jesus. Heal in the name of Jesus. Heal them now and make them well. Let your virtue flow to break every bondage, to heal soul, mind, and body. For your honor and glory, in the name of Jesus, and amen. And friend, watch every sign of improvement and give God praise and honor and glory. Now it's time to take that next step in spiritual growth, receiving the baptism and the Holy Ghost. You need the person of the Holy Ghost within you to set you on this path of pleasing Jesus when he returns. Go to the Word. Search it out. See for yourself that what I'm telling you is truth. It all comes straight from God's Word. And if you don't understand, the Lord will help you to understand about the Holy Ghost. The Word will help you understand. And if you don't have the faith to believe, let the Word increase your faith. Build up your faith to receive. Before I minister to you to receive the Holy Ghost, those of you here today, if any of you are in need of prayer, now is your opportunity to stand up, go over to the side. I'll minister to you over there shortly. And the rest of you, stand to your feet. Come to the altar today. Present yourself unto the Lord. Let the Holy Ghost bless you. Let Him anoint you. So that others will see God in you. That's what it's all about. That's the focus, that's the priority, the main priority in this life. So that others will see God in us. Through the power of the Holy Ghost. And those of you online, if you don't have the Holy Ghost, it's time to receive. So you may be at home or at church, wherever, lift up. Stand to your feet, lift up your hands unto the Lord. I'm going to pray and ask the Lord to anoint you to receive the Holy Ghost so that He can begin His perfect work in your daily life. So you start praising the Lord, glorifying Jesus, lifting up praises unto Jesus. Focus on praising Jesus. Because when the Holy Ghost comes in, when you are baptized, the Holy Ghost will take over your tongue. He will speak through you in another language, an unknown language. You won't do it, He will do it. In the name of Jesus, Lord, anoint the people to receive Your gift. Anoint the people to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, receive the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, receive the Holy Ghost. And friends, start praising the Lord, glorifying Jesus. Don't stop till the Holy Ghost comes in. Keep praising Jesus. Keep glorifying Jesus until the Holy Ghost comes in. Until the Holy Ghost comes in. Loving Jesus, lifting up those praises. Just you and Jesus, just you and Jesus, glorifying the King, glorifying Jesus, praising Jesus. Yes, yielding to that love, yielding to that grace, glorifying Jesus, praising Jesus, just you and Jesus. Just you and Jesus. Yes. Just you it all over. Let him fill you up. Glorify Jesus. Yes. Yes. Give all and receive all. Praise in Jesus. Praise in Jesus. Let that power go all through your body. Glorify the King. Praise in Jesus. Yes, let him bless you. Let him bless you. Just open up and receive. Give him that liberty. Give him that freedom. Yes, just you and Jesus. Just you and Jesus. Just you and Jesus. Just love him. Just 
His love, His love eats me. 